Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Jane Dyer, the president of the Rotary Club of Greenville, and would like to welcome each and every one of you with us uh, for our meeting today. We're especially honored to have uh, Mayor White speak to us. He has uh, uh, wonderfully spoken to our club for, for several years now, the 1st of January, to let us know what's happened in Greenville and what is upcoming for Greenville. And obviously this has been a very unusual year. So we certainly appreciate him coming and be willing to, uh, to update us on what's going on in Greenville. We also, of course, would like to welcome all our guests. If you are a guest with us today, please uh, go to the chat box and put your name and your um, place of business, if you would. We'd like for all of our Rotarians to be able to welcome you here. And of course, we're thrilled to have our Rotarians with us. Um, many of us haven't seen each other for a long time. And uh, so we're looking forward to the day that everybody's vaccinated and we can go back to Rotary more like it used to be. But in the meantime, thank you all for being here and um, make sure you go to the chat if you're a guest. And um, now I'd like to ask Josh Fowler if he would please lead us in our invocation and pledge. Thank you, Jane, and good afternoon, everyone. Now, please join me in today's invocation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today and thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. Thank you for this opportunity to come together as a Rotary Club to celebrate life, one another, and to celebrate what Rotary means to so many. Be with us this year and help us to continue fighting through the COVID pandemic in a positive way while being mindful and empathetic to those who have lost so much. Be with our country and help us to find peace and unity and give us the courage to lead the way in our day-to-day -day lives as Rotarians. Be with our first responders, give them courage and guidance and help us not forget the sacrifices they are making each and every day. And thank you for allowing us to live, work and play in such a wonderful community that we call Greenville. And for those that make, those that work so hard to make it so and help us never to take that for granted. Please keep us safe and healthy and help us to stay focused on service to those in need, amen. Now, please join me for the pledge. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. We appreciate that. Um, our Rotary Club is following the lead of Rotary International and Rotary Opens Opportunities. In our club, our opportunities, we're concentrating on networking, service, and fun. As far as networking goes, we have several opportunities. We have Networking at Noon, which is a small group um, event. It's going to be January the 21st. And we would like for you to come and share your insights on how you think vaccinations are going to affect and change your workplace. So please join us January the 21st at noon. Our next Rotary meeting is going to be um, on January the 26th. We're lucky and fortunate to have the CEO of Michelin North America, Alexis Garson. And so please join us for that. And then again, we're having lunchtime conversations. Um, this is a great opportunity to learn to discuss um, maybe challenging topics and it's a guided conversation for us to learn how to express ourselves and really listen to other people and their opinions. So we have many networking opportunities. We also have some great service opportunities. Um, for the month of January, we are doing a uniform drive at Alexander Elementary School. This is the school that our um, our Rotary Club has adopted, and these kids are amazing, but the needs of them are truly amazing also. In December, Devin Clement did a great job of um, opening up a food pantry at the school because the children and their families are in need of food. They have another need. Many of them are not able to afford the uniforms the school requires to wear them. And they're very simple. I think it's navy or khaki pants and then a polo of certain colors. So if you would like to join us in this uniform drive, you can donate $23 that will buy a complete uniform for these students. You can either um, go online to our website or send a check to Michelle. And that's for uniforms the month of January, $23 by the complete uniform. 
So please consider doing that. And um, we also have another great um, effort, Mask by Michelle, our own Michelle Patterson has made 3,420 masks. She has 200 ready to go to the Shriners Hospital for children. There, um, she's made 60 special ones for Valentine's and Law Enforcement Day, which is one of our special days in Rotary coming up in February. If you would like a mask, you can email Michelle and she's, she's asking, or we're asking donations to CART, which is a, a Rotary initiative Coins for, Alzheimer, Coins for Alzheimer's Research Trust. So for a dollar, you can get one of these amazing masks and also contribute to the Rotary Alzheimer's Trust. Um, so far, we've raised, our clubs raised $2,828, mostly because of Michelle's efforts. And in six days, since we've launched this ca campaign, we've raised $866. So this is another great opportunity. Our two um, service opportunities currently are uniforms for Alexandra Elementary or mask by Michelle. And like I said, we also do fun stuff. Coming up on February the 4th, we'll have our monthly 4.30 um, Zoom uh, J Plain Jane's Place. It's a club social. We invite all of you to attend, and it's a place for us to connect, converse, and chill. And right now, we all could use some of that, so I invite you to join us there. And of course, you know, Rotary really is something special. In fact, Michelle has gotten some phone calls in the past few weeks of people who are just interested in being part of Rotary, of what we have. So I'm inviting you to ask your friends and neighbors and people you work with who might be interested in uh, benefiting from our networking opportunities, engaging in our service projects, and enjoying the fun that we have as Rotarians. And the best way for them to learn about Rotary is at our Discover Rotary. We have two of them. One um, is in the evening, and that'll be January the 19th. And the daytime one is at 11, which is right before our next meeting um, on January the 26th. So invite a friend, um, colleague, neighbor to join us for um, Discover Rotary to learn more about what Rotary does. Details for these events and the ability to contribute is available at our website, greenvillerotary.org. And speaking of all the wonderful things that Rotary does, Connie Lancel is going to give us the Rotary International Foundation Spotlight, and you can see what great things Rotary does around the world. Connie, thank you. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. So glad to be here. This is another in our series of Rotary Foundation Spotlights, when we will provide uh, context and some stories and some short videos here to just help everybody understand the working significance of the Rotary Foundation. Just as a reminder, the vision of the Rotary Foundation is very simple doing good in the world. And there are six causes, which were free, uh, pre previously known as the areas of focus. And these causes address six of the world's greatest humanitarian needs. They include promoting peace, fighting disease, providing clean water and hygiene, saving mothers and children, supporting education, and growing our local economies. And as you remember, I hope, um, funding for these efforts comes from every Rotarian and all of our contributions into these global and district grants that address one or more of the focus areas. And locally here, the impact of those uh, grants can be as, as, as uh, local as the Alexander Elementary School and as far reaching as getting that last little bit of polio just wiped out. But today, Given the, the recent uh, goings on in the week, I thought we might register with everyone to focus on this particular area, um, peace. And um, we often talk about it in terms of peace um, and conflict resolution, um, but Rotary views it as sort of the ideal sum goal of all of the Rotary causes. So Rotary has identified four roles in which all of us can um, uh, promote peace. One of them, of course, is as a practitioner, which is what we're doing at Alexander Elementary by focusing especially on the education area. Another role is as educators. There are five Rotary Peace Centers around the world, and they've trained over 1,300 Peace Fellows, and those people go back in their roles in government or education and international organizations to continue to remote peace. Another role is as a mediator. 
and that has become quite apparent in trying to protect the vaccinators of the polio vaccine in Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, with a ceasefire that threatened to prevent them from being able to distribute this to at-risk children. And the other one is, is advocates. And an example of this in our own club is two years ago when we had the peace conference. And it, that involved people not only from our community, but really from all over the states and even some from around the world. So to put all this another way, um, I've included here an, an edited video that addresses the national need for peace and conflict resolution and how we Rotarians, and maybe right now it's needed more than ever, how we Rotarians can wage peace. Let's be honest. The world can seem scary. Violence, poverty, disease, corruption, pollution. The problems just seem too overwhelming, too big. You are just one person, right? Not if you are a Rotarian. You are part of a club, part of a district, part of an international network of 1.2 million Rotarians in 35,000 clubs in 200 nations. This makes you part of the largest and most impactful service organization in the world. As Rotarians, you have roughly the same human power as the world's most powerful militaries, but you are woven into the fabric of the community. Rotary as a global organization connects you with a network of passionate community leaders. I'll tell you what, I'm going to stop sharing right there because I think that's going to take too long for me to get this back. Um, so I'll show you that video another time. But here's the point of the rest of it is that in all of this, we Rotarians can be peacemakers. We have a role to play in all of this. And as much as we can, uh, we Rotarians would like to be able to wage peace. So thank you very much for listening to that. And I'll, uh, I'll show you the rest of that some other time. Thanks, Jane. Thank you very much, Connie. Um, and now Teresa Miller has something to share with us about sharing Rotary. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Teresa Miller, and I am so proud to belong and be a member to the Rotary Club of Greenville because of each of you and the impact together that we make on our community, which the video that we saw uh, Connie share really showed and amplified how together we have this amazing opportunity to impact our community for good. Uh, together, we all have high hopes for 2021, personally and professionally, and today we're here to hear Mayor White's hopes for Greenville in 2021 and beyond. And today I want to share my hopes for the Rotary Club of Greenville for this year. My hope is to grow our club membership with more quality members just like each of you. So today I'm here because I value each of you and I want you to help me do this. I'm asking each of you to think of three, just three, three people in your networks that you value three people in your networks that you value, and I want you to invite them to one of our upcoming events. Now, we have such a fabulous leadership here in our club that has lined up this amazing year in programming. We've got fabulous speakers. We've got community events coming and all kinds of opportunities for you to engage people that you value in your network to come and experience what we experience here at the Rotary Club of Greenville. So three ways that you can do that are through our social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, or you can pick up the phone and give them a call to invite them to one of their upcoming events. Now just upcoming in the next month, we've got fabulous opportunity. We have Discovery Rotary, which Jane talked about what that is and the value of that in our club. You can invite one of your friends to Discover Rotary. We've got Alex Garcin coming on the 26th which is a great opportunity. He was highlighted on, or is one of 50 of the most influential people here in Greenville. Fabulous opportunity for business. We have on February 9th, we have our law enforcement day. And then on February 23rd, we have a really special event that's sponsored by the Peace Committee. And you're not gonna wanna miss that. So today I'm asking just three people in your network that you value, invite them to one of these amazing upcoming events. It's super easy. Amy Randall and myself have been busy updating our Facebook and our LinkedIn. 
If you're not following us, I ask that today you go home, either pick up your smartphone or get on your computer, look up Rotary Club of Greenville, LinkedIn or Facebook and follow us. All of our events are posted in the events page. So easy for you to do. And I know you as a fellow Rotarian, you value what we do here and take this opportunity to invite people in your network that you think are fabulous and bring them here so we can impact our city and grow this amazing opportunity to do good in Greenville. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Um, next we'll have uh, Christine is going to introduce our speaker. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, back to the Zoom meetings again. Uh, so I am really excited today to introduce Mayor White. I first heard him speak actually at a junior league meeting um, around 2011, 2012. It was after I had moved back to Greenville. Uh, when I left Greenville in 1985, I did not think I would ever come back. But over the years, I saw Greenville progress and grow and really become a fabulous city to live in. And so I was very excited to come home in 2011. Uh, I actually don't live in Greenville. I live in Spartanburg County, but I greatly enjoy Greenville. So I wanted to not quite do the standard introduction. Um, on my screen, I cannot see Mayor White. Can you unmute yourself? I'm unmuted. Okay. I think so. so. Hope so. so we're going to do a little impromptu. I'm going to ask you five quick questions and you're just going to answer the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're a good, you're a good sport. Okay. Right. Right. Just real quick, short answers. Okay. And then I'll read your bio. Okay. First question is favorite vacation spot. The mountains. Okay. Favorite food. Hmm. Italian. Okay. Next item on your bucket list. Hmm. City wise. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, parks and annexation. Okay. If you could have dinner with one famous person dead uh, or alive, who would it be? George Fletcher. And Last question that I know everybody wants to hear the answer to. Tigers or Gamecocks? Oh, I have a, I'm from a, a, a Clemson family. My wife's okay. Clemson, so I have I made my mind up early on that one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that'll make Jane Dyer very happy. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm going to read your official bio. Okay. Well, I'll keep it um, really short. Keep it really short. Okay, I will. Uh, so you've served as... Mayor of Greenville since December 1995. Uh, key st strategic projects include removal of the Camperdown Highway Bridge and creation of Falls Park, uh, recruitment of new retail, a downtown major minor league baseball stadium, riverfront development, and initiation of a bike and walking trail system throughout the city. Uh, in 2018, you were named Pro, you were profiled in Time Magazine as one of 31 people who are changing the South. And I know that uh, the upcoming Unity Park is a special project for you. You are native of Greenville and a graduate of Wake Forest University and the University of South Carolina Law School. You're a partner at the law firm of Hainsworth, Sinclair and Boyd, where you head the firm's immigration and custom practices and you and your wife have two children. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and it is a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you very much. I don't get introduced very often by somebody from Spartanburg, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm glad to know you, uh, you learned all that. And uh, Rotary Club's really um, blessed to have Jane as the president this year because Jane, that was such a beautiful introduction for Zoom. Uh, you're just made for television. I think that's, uh, that's important uh, for the, this particular year. Um, let me see, hold it on. I have one technical thing on my end of it. Uh, Elizabeth? Yeah. Okay, all right, a little, little technical glitch there. 
Uh, we on uh, city council have had, we've been operating uh, with the Zoom meetings uh, really since March and um, it's actually worked very well. We have, an, we have, the public can come to the TD Center, Greenville Conference Center and uh, be there to speak to us or be online directly. And it's worked out very well. Last night's Monday meeting, however, <laughs> was our first major total collapse of our technology. <laughs> we were offline, online, offline, offline. Turned out it was a regional issue. It wasn't just at City Hall, but we had quite a night last night. So if anybody happened to hear about that, it was uh, about as bad as you could be. Uh, but we've been lucky, uh, Jane, we've been lucky on uh, up until last night to have these meetings. So yours looks very good. I'm, I'm really impressed. I always enjoy coming to Rotary Club. And particularly um, in, in person because uh, there's so many members who uh, sort of uh, keep me honest uh, and I appreciate that. I'm looking at you, Bert, and a few other, <laughs> and Bob Howard and a bunch of other folks. So uh, it's always a humbling experience to come to downtown Rotary Club and a lot of people who um, play a role in that. Well, this is a Zoom call, so I'm just going to, this won't be a normal speech. I'm going to try to make it as conversational as I can be, and I'm also going to try to keep it as brief as I can, so you can just ask some questions. We're all dealing with so many, so many issues right now. Uh, just some, some latest, this is kind of outside of our, our usual, but in dealing with, uh, with COVID, um, which is a story in itself, of course, for everybody, including local governments. Um, I understand that Prisma Health will have a press conference tomorrow that's going to talk about the issue that's on everybody's mind, and that is the vaccination program. Um, if you're wondering when you read in the paper right now, like what is going on, or one, what one phone one phone call one phone uh, number to call or something in DHEC? Well, yeah, that's right. And uh, don't call City Hall. We've already had several people call us here, and. Um, but tomorrow, Prisma Health is going to have some announcements, I understand. I hope that's going to help clarify things, some new thinking. But I, I certainly, from what I understand and we're being told, uh, between DHEC and Prisma Health and the state, uh, much of, many of the decisions have not been made yet or not been announced in terms of what they're going to do. But clearly, what they're doing now is not going to be enough. So watch for some big announcements tomorrow. Um, you know, we started down this road dealing with COVID, and I think we'd all agree back in March and April, you, you probably knew, knew, personally knew no one who had it, uh, which presented a whole set of, of issues. Well, things have changed pretty radically on that score. I'm, sh I'm sure if I ask for a hand raise, I think I will. How many people have someone in their family or somebody close to them who have had COVID? Um, yeah. And we've had a, a member of Greenville City Council, John DeWorkin. It's been about two weeks. He's now emerging from into the world again but he had a, a bad case he and his wife um and then um you know i've got a, a friend who's a doctor at prisma health who's been one of the leaders in dealing with covid and uh, he now has covid uh well, he's one of our go-to guys and i talked to him just the other night and i asked him i said well what you know since you're the expert on covid he actually sounded pretty good but he let me know that he was in a little interlude sometimes that happened he was feeling okay but then he goes completely down and was feeling really, really, really bad. But anyway, I asked him what his symptoms were. And, um, it, and he said to me, he said, funny you ask that because I've got a symptom that is actually something we see fairly frequently at, at Prisma Health, but, but it's very seldom mentioned in any of the newspaper articles or articles about COVID. And I thought, well, that was curious. So, so what is this symptom that you have that isn't talked about much? And he said to me, <laughs> that he had he was experiencing severe like he said the worst you can imagine leg cramps uh, he said that the other night about three o'clock in the morning uh, he said it was like somebody walked into his room and with a baseball bat and just started swatting him on his knees and he said the doctor in him started thinking oh my goodness this is the leg cramp symptom we've been hearing about and it go and he also knew he said that it goes in waves that once you got it, it might last for th several hours in waves and he said that's what happened he had no sleep that night this is a couple nights ago at all as it would stop and start during the night so all on that cheery note um we have to take uh covid very seriously uh, some people have you know you you read about you know, what the city's doing and the county's doing i just want to let you know on the ground level uh our police department, our fire department, our permitting people. We have a whole team of folks who are on the ground every day, and I can personally attest to their direct engagement in these issues in terms of following up on tips of where violations are occurring. And I, and I mean by that, 
pretty serious things. We have a helpline that people have always called us on called Greenville Cares. That's what you call it. If you're a city resident, you know it well. That's what you call if you're if you're if they if they've missed picking up your your leaves or something like that. Well, now it's a COVID hotline as well. And that's worked out well, but we get a lot of tips. And, and I would tell you that it's been a good thing because we do see patterns when, when a particular company in town and repeatedly people are calling us about that company, there is an issue there. So we do site visits um, to businesses, big and small restaurants, bars, businesses based on the tips. And, and we do this. And I just want to let you give an example of this. I was talking to Chief Howie Thompson the other day during the month of December, uh, our team, if you will, paid a visit on 262 businesses, 262 in the month of December. Now that probably includes the infamous New Year's Eve uh, uh, week. Uh, so far this month of January, they're about 41, 42 visits. And that was a couple days ago. So we're active and engaged. And, and well, the good news is this, in every one of these, virtually every case, uh, we get their attention and we, <laughs> get the manager's attention, the business owner, and things improve. There have been very few cases of pushback. Um, but we do take uh, tips, if, you know, employees who call us to talk about that you know, they're working in a business, small shop, or even a big box store, which has been the case one particular place, and, and they're feeling like, they, you know, no one's paying any attention to the mass rules. And I don't mean the, I don't mean the customers. I mean, I'm talking employees and the boss, if you will. That's, that's really, you know separate category. Speaking of New Year's Eve, because this received a little more attention, especially on social media, um, early on in December, uh, about the middle of December, the Greenville News printed a list of all the great activities available to people in Greenville on New Year's Eve. And you may have seen, the, seen it. It was like, uh, <laughs> there it is. Um, I don't know how many are on here. And uh, we thought this was helpful information. And virtually every one of this gosh, 20, 30, 20, 30 events uh, we paid a visit on and one or two received some particular notoriety because we did, um, believe it or not, have some that were just so blatant. I'm, you know, I'm not talking about small gathering. I'm talking about people who got on social media and advertised uh, with, a, with a high level of sophistication, actually, uh, advertised, you know, big, big event at the gala at the river, uh, received a lot of attention that wasn't the only one and actually advertised, come on to our event in one particular case, and you, you may have heard about this, they actually advertised on their website that they had the governor's, Governor Henry McMaster's permission to, ex, to uh, serve drinks after 11 p.m. and that they did not have to observe the mask rules. It was in their, in their media. And we got scores of calls from other businesses. That's who alerted us to it, other restaurants and bars saying, what is this? And, you know, we, we have our rules, we're, we're shutting down at 11. They're not. Well, none of that turned out to be true. The governor's office never gave them permission to serve after 11. The governor's office never said anything, never had any contact with them, in fact. Um, in this particular case, though, we, we spent an amazing amount of our time and energy, our police department and others, back and forth with the state because we, you know, we had that and a few others that were just kind of blatant things. So anyway, on the COVID thing, there's a lot of enforcement going on that you're, if you, if you anything you hear otherwise is not the case. A lot of enforcement going on and a lot of conversation. Good news is again, in most cases, somebody slipped up or somebody was just momentarily being a jerk and we can, we can talk to them later. So we, we're taking COVID very seriously. We're certainly gonna uh, do what we can to help out on the, on the vaccination coordination if they ask us to in terms of facilities or anything they need. We've got the, we're letting everybody know, hey, we, we own a certain conference center. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of space there for people to space out and other facilities of the city. So if they're, we've, uh, we've let them know we're very much engaged in that. Uh, impact of COVID. Well, really in terms of our budget impact and such, well, it's next year we're gonna really see some, some uh, impact, I think, with business licenses being down and things like that. However, however, without getting into the weeds, um, let's just say that all of our our dire expectations have turned out to be overly pessimistic. Uh, things are better. Even the hospitality tax, which is a food and beverage tax, uh, has not declined anything like we thought it was going to. Uh, that's good for a lot of the extra quality of life things we get to do, because that's the tax that you, you can use to support tourism-related projects. That's your parks, 
and special events and things like that. So it looks like we're really going to come out okay. We've been, and we've been working with the expectation of the worst. And so I think budget-wise, I think we're going to come out fine. It certainly has had no effect on fundamental services, police, fire, public works, um, all of our neighborhood programs from our very, what is now a massive program of building sidewalks throughout the city. That's unaffected road repaving unaffected. I can go down a whole list. So that's really the, the good news. Uh, some other things we've just kind of held up on. Uh, we also are able to continue to fund um, our, our affordable housing initiatives are funded at the exact the same level we wanted to a couple years ago. So we're still on track there about $3 million this past year and uh, public transportation, which received a pretty whopping increase from the county and the city two years ago, by the way. Um, and that's a good good news story, the county and the city, uh, a, a really huge increase from just a couple years ago. Well, anyway, that, those are still on, on track, so we're really in good shape there. Um, the other, so the fundamentals of the budget are fine. Uh, what we're looking at next year uh, in particular is we're uh, proceeding with our, our biggest projects, our goals of creating more green space and parks in the city, which is an overarching big goal we have. Um, going forward and a large part of that is Unity Park down on the river. Uh, what's going on there now is if you go down there, we are in the middle of construction. It's a two year construction project. And at this moment, as we speak, the Reedy River is being bulldozed uh, starting at the far end uh, because the river, which actually the current river that you make, if you're if you're walking along the Swamp River Trail and you see the Reedy River through there, it is basically let's face it, it's a ditch. And that ditch was dug in 1935. It's a WPA project. It's not, it's man-made and it's done very poorly, by the way. Uh, they had this wrong-headed idea that the way to handle stormwater back then they, is, was to dig a hole. And if that doesn't work, dig it deeper, dig it deeper. So that's why it's built the way it is. Well, we know better now. We know better how to contain water, work with water. And uh, what we're doing now is, st is state of the art. So we're literally digging the, the river. And at the end of the day, the Reedy River, uh, as it moves through what is going to be Unity Park, will be a more of a gentle sloping area. It'll be a beautiful place to walk along and you can walk in back virtually into the river. And when the flooding comes, and it does come in that area, it will be more natural, uh, more natural containing area for the flood. So right now, I'm um, pleased to say there's a massive work being done on, on the Reedy River. Uh, if you go over there also, you'll see just construction everywhere because uh, the whole area is being reconfigured for the beautiful park that's going to be created and be ready in about two years. Uh, the park project has proceeded along. The other really good news is uh, we started out this year in terms of our private fundraising. Uh, we felt like with COVID and all that, that our fundraising efforts would be jeopardized, but exactly the opposite has happened. Uh, we've realized more private dollars and surprise donations in the last two or three months and we had the entire three years of our effort. It's been about two, two, I guess two and a half years of private fundraising. So we had a goal of raising, privately raising about $10 million to create some of the great amenities in the park, the children's spray park, the playgrounds for the kids, uh, some really great public spaces along the, uh, throughout the park. Our goal was to raise $10 million. We have exceeded the goal of $10 million as of a couple of weeks ago. So the generosity has been amazing. Just to share with you just some personal stories, because when I, when I look at the list of the companies and the people who have donated, I mean, Michelin, $1 million, um, long list of private companies, but also a lot of individuals, there are two, uh, two stories recently I just want to share with you, just the surprises we get. Um, we had a couple uh, who moved back to, uh, well, a fellow who has a technology company, and he left Greenville about 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, to move to Los Angeles. And um, he and his company have decided that they've had it with California. I think we're going to hear a lot of this in the future, but this is one of the first real life episodes. And he has moved back to Greenville, but he's brought back with him his Los Angeles wife. Now that's an interesting story too. <laughs> She's only known LA, she's never been to Greenville. He said, trust me, you'll love it. So they have come back to Greenville and he's gonna be expanding the business here in Greenville and came to see us 
came to see me and we talked about his plans for uh, a new development in downtown Greenville for the new company. Uh, met his wife, again, who'd never been to South Carolina before. And I will tell you that her first uh, two months or so in Greenville, everything, everything's new, everything's different, everything's amazing, good and bad. She has a lot to say about that. You can imagine the culture shock. Um, but they made it really clear that they were impressed with the sense of, uh, of energy and positive spirit they felt like they saw in Greenville and the plan and, and what has happened to downtown. So he's been gone over, over 10 years. So he saw the changes and not only going to, not only are they going to do something dramatic in downtown Greenville, but he asked the question, well, if I'm going to come back here and kind of restart my company in Greenville, uh, by the way, they're in about eight or nine other cities across the country, but LA was the headquarters. Now going to be Greenville's going to be the headquarters. He said, I'd like to give back to the community on the front end to let you know how serious I am. Does the city, this is the kind of question I guess, I love this kind of question as mayor, does the city have any particular project you would like, <laughs> you would like us to look at, <laughs> help toward? And I said, well, actually we do. You, he had expressed an interest in the green space and all of that. And I told him about Unity Park. And I told him about the, uh, that a good bit of the project is also about affordable housing to create a beachhead of affordable housing in the middle of the city where it otherwise would not be happening. And I showed him the plans for that. And in the first meeting, for at, right after the PowerPoint presentation was given, he wrote a check for $250,000. Now we're walking out, I was very grateful for that. That's the kind of contributions we get, $250,000. And um, we walked out of the meeting in the parking lot. He looked at me, he said, you know, I actually could give you a million dollars, but I just want to do 250 right now. As the park goes along, we might do more. So, so we'll keep him in mind. Other side of the coin, but kind of related, uh, another person, uh, I'm, I'm going to use his name. This another person's name is Wayne Trotter. Wayne Trotter is from Greenville, but he spent his career out, out, of, out of Greenville. And in fact, he was with the foreign, U.S. Foreign Service. And so he's been in Japan and Asia most of his career. He just recently moved back to Greenville. And Wayne Trotter's father, going back many generations, owned a lot of real estate. And he owned a lot of real estate in West Greenville. And, and among the properties his family has owned for generations is a, is a nice sized piece of property near the, the main post office off of Washington Street, uh, just on the edge, on the edge of the Unity Park. But he didn't know that when he came back to Greenville. Uh, only thing he knew was he'd been gone for 20 plus years. He's come back and people kept calling him, his father is now deceased, kept calling him, expressing interest in the property he, <laughs> his family's had over on Alpha Trotter Street. I mean, his name is Wayne Trotter, I'm sorry, the uh, off of um, Oscar Street. And, and he didn't know why. He, he, he had no idea why anybody suddenly is interested in this property. And we, of course, he learned about Unity Park. And then he really learned about Unity Park. And just like our technology friend, he heard the whole story about building a 60 acre park uh, for, the, for the next generation in Greenville to clean up the Reedy River uh, and to build affordable housing. And he was being offered by many people a lot of money to buy his property. Now, I would guesstimate that for the size of property he had that he probably could have gained, I, no, no kidding, I would say close to a million dollars. That's how crazy, how crazy the market forces are over there right now in property sales. But let's just be conservative and say 500,000. <laughs> Wayne Trotter lost his wife about a month after he came back to Greenville. Whole career in Asia, um, finally retiring, came back to Greenville with his wife. She died tragically of a, of a, of a cancer. Wayne decided to donate his family property to Unity Park and on the condition it be used for affordable housing. And so Wayne Trotter's property is now part of our collection of properties that we have set aside for affordable housing on the edge of the park. All, all of it highly valued property by today's market. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you that story. I, um, that was a complete surprise. And, um, but honestly, that's been the story of Unity Park and our private fundraising. The stories are just legion. Every, 
when I say we have $10 million in donations, behind that $10 million is are people and companies who went through a process of looking at the project, thinking about it, asking lots of questions, and something about the project moved them uh, to, to make a major donation, and hence we have a, a good amount for that. And finally, uh, along the river, um, if you take Unity Park and just uh, go to go away from the park and back into downtown, do you know there's only one more piece of private property, if you will, st still undeveloped? And it would be near the Embassy Suites Hotel, um, where the Children's Garden is, and, and Children's Garden over there. And it's property owned by uh, Bo Autry, longtime Greenville developer, and Phil Hughes, a longtime Greenville developer. Uh, Phil owns about two thirds of it, and Bo owns a third. Uh, Bo bought it originally. Uh, he owns the. Uh, he's a developer of the, of the Embassy Suites Hotel, and he really bought it to provide extra parking for the hotel. Uh, that was his motivation a couple years ago, and they're the ones who who worked with us to put this land aside for a new conference center for Greenville. And I'll just kind of bring you up to date on that. When you read about the conference center, please know that don't think about the Greenville Convention Center. Don't think about the TD Center. If you do, you're, you're, off, you're off target. This is something different. Um, it's gonna be smaller. It's gonna be much more focused on bringing out of town people, companies, individuals to Greenville with, a, with an eye toward economic development. In other words, we wanna have a conference center that's really gonna have a, gonna tie into our economic development goals. So if we're a community that, that is attractive to engineering companies, to automotive companies, perhaps in broadly defined technology, the kind of people and events we hope to have there in the future will be tied to those goals. So yes, it'll still be available to, you know, for a Rotary Club annual uh, meeting or something. It'll still be available for that, but it's not primarily be focused on that. It's gonna be focused on something different. So we don't need as much square footage that we have out there over on uh, 291 it'll be smaller and we're still working with consultants. We hired a whole team of consultants to, we want to get it right sized. Uh, there'll be a ballroom about the same size as the current ballroom, but the breakout spaces and all are going to be very different. So it's going to have a different mission, different size. And, and, and hear me on this too. It's going to be mixed use. In other words, when you drive by it, it's not going to be some big old box over there. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be, you're going to drive by and you're going to see shops and stores and uh, residential and maybe probably a small hotel attached to it as well but it's going to be a mixed use development and finally it's going to include the bob jones art gallery collection which is just fabulous and a major collection of the greenville art museum it's going to have two art museums as part of it and i say that because you know i told you i started by telling you that it's the last property on the river well what a great place for the greenville art museum to be what a great place for any art museum to be then on the river um, it's putting them in, putting those, those institutions in premier space. Uh, they're both private efforts. I mean, in other words, the government's not going to, we're not going to be building those spaces, but uh, they're going to have private fundraising for each of them. Uh, but we're going to set aside some spaces for them to build their facilities. So if you, you might envision going into a uh, kind of a major public space along the river, um, you know, four, three or four stories high, a ballroom, if, I mean, uh, entry area, foyer, and maybe on one side is is the mid is the uh, Renaissance art collection. On the other side is a more modern art collection um, and facilities, and those will be op operating all the time. The, the place would never go dark like the current center does. They'll always it'll always be open. People there and this kind of thing. And then when we have events, people can enjoy that as a as a side benefit. So it's an arts and cultural center, and a conference center, on the river, near the hotels near the restaurants, near, <laughs> near the coffee shops, near all the things that, that visitors uh, want to see and want to have access to. So that's what we're trying to do. And the good news is we have the county's participation in this. Wouldn't that be possible without it? So we have a, we still have, even with the changes in county council, we seem to have strong support for making this happen. And I, and I really appreciate that because, you know, we don't have any county assistance at all, not a dime at the current conference center it means it's all on the city of Greenville to subsidize it and keep it going and that will change and we also have a, a we expect to have a grant uh, with the governor's support from the state of South Carolina so it's a state county and city financed um, facility and that would allow us then to redevelop the the old conference center site on 291 
Um, you know, that's a great, uh, great facility. It's way bigger than Greenville ever needed because it was built for the textile industry. So it was overbuilt. We don't, we would never build something that big today, but it, but it has its virtues. I know I enjoy going out there, but in terms of attracting visitors or attracting um, serious conferences, conferees on serious topics, it doesn't do that. People hear that, oh, it's not downtown. It's not near a hotel. You have to, you have to be brought in. They're not interested in doing that. Unless they just have a huge love of Krispy Kreme donuts, there's just no reason to um, to choose Greenville, South Carolina or some other city. Well, those are the great things we're still working on. I, and I want to conclude with that. Our folk, you know, we're still focused. We're, we know what we're about. We're about, we have a comp plan that's coming out that spells it out well. We're going to continue focusing on our downtown, our mixed use, making sure we, we rebuild our retail in downtown Greenville. And we will, we will, because we've got a lot of good stuff in the pipeline. We want to make sure that uh, we have green spaces and parks in second to none anywhere. Uh, we want to make sure we have a community that's welcoming everyone. So hence the focus on affordable housing and uh, making ourselves as, again, welcoming to everyone so they can live in the city. And um, that's what we're still going to be about. And we continue to do that. We'll continue to make Greenville uh, the most beautiful, liberal, and welcoming city in America. So thank you. What's up, Jane? What happens next? Okay, Christine is going to come up and she is going to take questions from the chat and she will um, read those aloud for everybody and give you the opportunity to answer them. Okay, so I have uh, the first one came from Teresa Miller. You answered this a little bit, though. She was asking uh, about Unity Park, uh, the financing of Unity Park since since obviously the city has lost some revenue in, in taxes. You sort of address this. It seems like uh, you're relying more on personal donations instead. Well, the, the hospitality money that was designated for Unity Park was fixed in concrete a couple years ago. And even with the dip in hospitality revenues, uh, that money has is, is, is been there, so we did bond it. So we have a, a very nice size bond to pay for Unity Park and then supplemented by the private donations. So we're, we're fine. Um, just like we're paying off bonds for Falls Park and other, other projects. Those are all fixed in the budget. They're fine. And every, anytime we have a dip, it just affects the amounts beyond that uh, for special things that may come up. But, it, but that's what I was saying, actually, that we're in good shape on that, too. They're even accounting for all these projects, such as Unity Park, we actually have uh, higher revenues than we expected to have. Okay. Uh, Kathy McAfee asked about masks. Uh, the city of Greenville has been pretty strict on masks. Uh, have you had communication with other cities? And do you know why they're not as strict as Greenville? And uh, why hasn't the state issued a statewide mandate? Yeah, the city of Greenville was the first city in South Carolina to have a mass ordinance. Um, I want to quickly add that about the time we went on the limb, if you will, by having a mask ordinance, about the, about a week later, about a week later, in almost, almost in lockstep, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, a lot of the big boxes nationally adopted the same policy. And I'll be honest with you. While I think it was important that we have a mask ordinance, and I still do, I think the biggest benefit about it has been the message it sent, back, especially back in June. It, it got people's attention, who people who don't live in the city. And frankly, when Walmart did it and CVS and Walgreens and all the others, uh, I'm not, you know, that, that was even a bigger impact. Uh, that, that caused more people to actually think about it and for the first time even buy a mask, Frank. Mm -hmm. So it all comes together. You know, that was back in the summer. Uh, I never thought, though, back in the summer, that here we are, you know, now where we are today, and that it's still there would be no mask rules in in the county, and in most other cities. I mean, uh, and then across South Carolina, most of the cities have mask ordinances. Some counties do, but but just a few. And uh, I think that is regrettable because the it's been shown to be effective, and it's the one thing the healthcare community just pra practically pleads with us to do. Uh, so, you know, it's still got to be, you know, overarching, it's, it's voluntary, you know, people, if people just 
aren't willing to do it, you can, there's not a lot you can do. But uh, we're just the city of Greenville. We're just a small part of a much larger county, of course. And so our the effectiveness of what we're doing has always been sort of undermined by the fact that it's not required everywhere else. So uh, what is the actual punishment for any businesses that that don't follow the ordinance? We have some fines built in, but we said from the beginning, and we're no different here from other cities, that we're not out there trying to punch, you know, pop people for not wearing a mask in that sense. Instead, what we've done is what I started out by telling you about. We've been very, we have been very aggressive on the ground level about uh, visiting businesses based on tips or things we see. Um, we 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 pay a visit and it seems to be effective. I mean, we we've had very few repeat offenders, if you will, once we paid a, a visit. So that's that's where our, our efforts been. We're not trying to collect a few dollars here and there. That's that's just not what we're about. Okay. You mentioned earlier that the next thing on your bucket list was parks and annexation. What what are your thoughts on annexation? <laughs> did I say that? Yes, you did. Well, listen, we'll, we'll keep it a secret, okay? Let's don't, okay. don't, don't tell anybody. Um, no, I, we, we do annex in City Greenville, and I, I'm a strong believer in it for a lot of reasons, but one of the big reasons is I, I believe in what the city's about. I, I believe it's important that City Greenville be there to speak out on issues like during COVID. Uh, that the city of Green will be there to speak out on a whole lot of issues and, and have a big voice in what happens in Greenville County uh, on development and that we that we grow the right way and that we're attentive to quality growth and all that kind of thing. So I think it's important. So that's why I mean, I'm highly biased. I think everybody should be in the city. But we are looking the fact is there's a lot of properties uh, just adjacent to the city uh, on the west side of town in particular that are undeveloped. Uh, if you fly over in a helicopter, it's a lot of empty land but things are beginning to happen. So on the west side of town, it's a classic case of, do you wanna see this fairly vast area, the old mill village areas and all, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not talking about the mill villages per se, but just around the old mills where there's a lot of vacant land. Do you wanna see those areas developed uh, over time uh, with some oversight by the city of Greenville, or you want them just to go wherever they might go if, if it's in the, just in the county? I think we provide a lot of services on that. And there's just a lot of other places where I think we could do be more uh, intentional about trying to make the case for annexation. And one other thing, just you know, just so you all know this, in the west side of Greenville in particular, I mean the entire West Greenville area, those areas actually are, are high tax areas. It comes as a shock to people, but um, those pe people in those areas pay higher taxes, higher property taxes to be outside the city than in the city. And that's a situation that's developed over the last 20 and 30 years. Um, and even closer into town in Chanticleer, the Chanticleer neighborhood, everybody in Chanticleer pays higher taxes, higher water bill, everything, for the privilege of not being in the city of Greenville. Mm. Uh, whereas in the city, you get faster police protection, you get neighborhood services at a level that if you're not in the city of Greenville, you just don't understand it. We, the service level is just superb in terms of basic governmental services, everything from picking up your leads to responding to your calls. You have a mayor and a council that are very neighborhood focused and uh, that has never been more true than right now. So we have a great story to tell and uh, I want to make sure we do it. Okay. So I have a bunch of questions and I'm going to go through them um, and <laughs> Jane can just cut me off whenever I need to be cut off. So how many people will accommodate uh, Will the new conference center accommodate for a meeting with breakout sessions? Yeah, well, actually, again, we've hired some good consultants because that is the key question is how much breakout space we need and such. But we have made the decision that the big ballroom will be exactly the same as the ballroom we currently have. We think that works very well for the community. It's been time tested, if you will, and our consultants tend to agree. I think the issue is going to be more um, breakout spaces and exhibition space and things like that because really we're just not trying to build a big exhibition hall that's just not what this is about okay is there an official 10 person group rule in greenville or just your policy <laughs> yeah that's our rule uh we're out there enforcing the governor's rules uh in terms of crowds and such uh, but those numbers are actually you know pretty high but that's that's been the kind of minimum standard that we're out there reminding people about. Uh, here at the city, we've adopted, I just call it an informal rule that 
nobody in the city addresses crowds of more than 10 or 15 people. Hadn't really been an issue, by the way, um, except when Jane first called us about the Rotary Club. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, thought, yeah. I thought, surely they're not meeting. Uh, it has, you know, it hasn't really come up that often. Every, I, we had one last week where they called, they called the meeting off when they realized what they had done. They said, well, wait a minute, we didn't think about, we can't be having 50 people meeting next week. Uh, that wasn't us. That was, they came to their own conclusion on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, what plans, what, what plans do you have for the area between Church Street and the Bohemian? Oh, that's a good sophisticated question. Uh, one of the best uh, development areas in downtown Greenville is the mm. footprint of the area between the um, Camperdown project and uh, Church Street Bridge. It's a warehouse and district, warehouses and parking. Uh, it only has two land owners. Good news is we're engaged with both of them. And I think that's an obvious place and a very good place for people to look at for further development in the area. But I think you're gonna see a lot of things changing. I would make confidently make that prediction. Everything be, uh, around the Bohemian Hotel back uh, behind the camper down is, it's all in play for sure right now. And that was one thing about COVID as you noticed, uh, development didn't stop. Mm -hmm. And oh, let me tell you all this, uh, this is interesting. Before COVID, we had two, let me count now. Yeah, well, okay, two big new hotel projects that had been announced just before COVID. They were announced in West End of Greenville next to the baseball stadium and another one on the street. Now that's in addition to the Bohemian Hotel and some others that were underway. But we had two announced in early, or early 2020. And you might think, well, surely those projects announced just before COVID that those two hotels would have just gone away, right? They haven't gone away. <laughs> uh, both of both the developers of both those hotels or out of town folks have been in touch with us just in the last couple of weeks to reaffirm that they're still in the game. Um, and I, and I feeling about both of them, both of them architecture, I've been, we're all concerned about some of the projects that were built in the last couple of years, especially some apartments that really looked uh, pretty ugly pretty bad and we changed our design standards accordingly and I think things have gotten definitely better but these hotels are a good example both of them are just some of the best architecture we've ever been we've ever seen for downtown Greenville just absolutely creative and superb and um, both of them are back in the game uh, I guess they're you know they're thinking they're thinking the future they're not worried about what the situation is right now so we're going to see groundbreaking I think on two hotels before the end of this year for sure in the West End. Okay, Jane is giving me the the cutoff. So. <laughs> I'm, all I'm all for that. All for that. Well, sir, we of course want to be respectful of people's time, and um, just thank you so much for being here. You'll see there are plenty more questions, and we just want to thank you for your leadership of our city, especially during these times, and um, what you have helped turn Greenville into. And we are so proud to be a part of that, and proud to be Rotarians and um, work toward making Greenville even better. Well, I want to get one final word in, and that is I appreciate everything uh, Rotary does. And one of my observations in dealing in this crazy world we're in right now, where we get, you know, we get the emails and all from the same kind of people who stormed the Capitol. Um, you know what really runs through my mind when I've seen some of these people individually or read their emails? I'm thinking these are some people who feel, who are very isolated from their communities. Um, they're not in a Rotary Club. And, and there's this kind of, they're like people who they feel isolated and they, they're not, to say they're not engaged would be an understatement. They really don't understand the world around them, the community around them. They've never participated in anything. And so they're just susceptible, I'm afraid, to the worst kind of ideas and thoughts of conspiracies and everything else uh, because they know very little about how their own communities work and they're not engaged. So it's more important than ever that, that we really think about the whole idea of community engagement. I'm not saying anybody in Rotary Club is going to go storm the Capitol, but um, I just think uh, more and more it's important, uh, maybe especially young people, that um, being a part of something, whatever it is, um, whether it's a church or club, anything um, that's bigger than just sitting at home on your computer reading conspiracy theories is, is probably more important than ever. Because if there's, that's just one of the strings that runs through it. I'm talking to people who honestly just know nothing about their own backyard, much less the country. So good job and thank you for all you do.
Thank you. Thank you, Mayor White. Thank you very much for being with us. We look forward to seeing you again next year, if not sooner. And um, I want to thank, of course, all of our Rotarians and just what Mayor White just said is that we have so many people in our Rotary Club that do so much good. So I want to thank you for that and your involvement. And um, also, I want to remind everybody, our next meeting, we'll have uh, Alexis Garson, the CEO of Michelin, join us. That's on the 26th. And as we complete this meeting, like every meeting, we'll um, recite our four-way test. So if everybody would recite with me, of the things that we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial? Beneficial to all concerned. Thank you. And that can meeting and we look forward to seeing you next time.